Thanks for tuning in. Hi everyone, welcome. Thank you for coming on this rainy afternoon. We appreciate it. I'm here with the one and only, my name is Meg Murphy, and I have the honor today of, of interviewing Kim Blackwell. She's a dear friend and mentor to me. She is Fourth Line Theater's Managing Artistic Director. She's a veteran Fourth Line Director Producer. 2023 marks her 30th year, which is amazing. Yeah, it is. Since you're right. only 35. <laughs> the first but not the last fake smoke. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you. She has directed 27 productions, including 15 world premieres. She's directed across Canada and the U.S., and her play that she wrote herself called A Daughter has it, it had its world premiere in 2020 here in Peterborough and was selected to be part of the International Rural Women's Studies Conference hosted by University of Guelph in 2021. Kim was inducted into Peterborough's Pathway of Fame in 2016. And in 2020, she received Toronto theatre critic Lynn Slotkin's John Kaplan Mensch Award. And she recently joined the Playwrights Guild of Canada and she's working on her first solo full-length play for Fourth Line Theatre called The Lost Souls, if I may. Thank you. <laughs> Kim Blackwell. <laughs> so Kim, 30 years at Fourth Line, just a small contribution. But I want to go back, way back, Back to growing up in Peterborough, back to where you had your first taste of theatre in the hallowed halls of Peterborough Theatre Guild and All Saints. Tell me about your life as a, a mouse and an old woman. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Oh, that's so funny you're asking me about that. Um, so All Saints, I was the mouse in, uh, it was in the, the um, parish hall that's next to the main building, Rosendo, and I was raised at All Saints. Went there the whole time, baptized, confirmed, the whole deal. Um, and it was uh, the night before Christmas. It was the night before Christmas, and I was another creature was starting. Not even a not mouse. Even a I mouse. was the mouse <laughs> sleeping under a table for the whole of the little play. And when I stood up to do the, I guess that would be my first curtain call. The back of the costume ripped right off. <laughs> <laughs> so I think maybe that's a metaphor for my life. Like I love the curtain call, but sometimes I just have the split costume up the back that I have to traverse. <laughs> And then it's so interesting in grade four, I think it was in grade four, you know, Nancy Bethune, those of you who would know the Peterborough Theatre Guild, Nancy Bethune was the doyen of makeup there for 50 Ever. or more yeah. years. And she and her husband, Bud Bethune, I think maybe they're both past now. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. bless their souls. She uh, did a workshop for kids one Saturday morning and I got picked to do this makeup workshop and she transformed me into an old woman. And I remember sitting in that guild makeup area where they had the tables with the, like the big balls. bright lights yeah with the yeah, bright oh, bulbs yeah. all around famous. and i saw myself as that old woman and that magic of the possibilities of what theater can do and how it can transport us and make us believe something it, it really does the kernel of it starts from there my love of theater it's a lifelong love of an obsession a little bit with theater i think that's amazing see it's yeah. theater guild and a little mouse with slip pants it's really the beginning of all good stories. But then you left theater for a long time, and you had many other iterations. So tell me about, uh, you were a chef, you are well-versed in balloon art, you um, have some experience with jewelry. Tell me about these experiences. Well, certainly um, balloon art, yeah. I, I, you know, I got into the BFA program at York. That's where I was supposed to go. I got a scholarship to go to York to do my BFA in acting. For acting. Yeah. Okay. And I spent a summer working for the city of Peterborough, uh, in one of their summer programs and I had this revelation that I wasn't ready to go to university. Now in retrospect my parents should have slapped that out of me <laughs> and made me go. They should have bribed me. I'm talking to my daughter. Yeah, I, say, I should have got at least the first year under my belt of the BFA program but I decided I saw an ad in the Peterborough Examiner that a couple who were originally from Lindsay were looking for a nanny oh. to go to uh, Fort McMurray, Alberta mm. and so I gave up York. Was that because you were scared? Why did you, were you nervous? Yeah, I talked about it as finding myself at the time, but I think I was scared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I was scared. And uh, I didn't necessarily want to fail at the one thing I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so I went to Fort McMurray and I was a nanny. And then that didn't last very long because I was not very good at it. <laughs> no, no children were hurt in the, uh, <laughs> the making of my career as a nanny in Fort McMurray. But I got to Edmonton and then you know, I was waitressing and bartending and all these things and ended up working for this balloon decorating company. And so learned how to make huge balloon arches and I have worked with helium and balloons so much. Like, <laughs> it's crazy to think about. <laughs> yeah, and then through another part of my life, I was an air cadet here at the 534 Squadron here in Peterborough and 
um, when I was a kid and I, I ended up in the United States in the early to, uh, 1990s and ended up in New Orleans and I ended up cooking at one of the top 10 restaurants in the United States, mm -hmm. Gabrielle. Yeah, Kim is an incredible cook, and we recently had nah, we recently had a dinner. Um, it was part of the auction for the gala last year, and we fulfilled it recently um, for those who, folks who purchased it. And she did this incredible meal, and it was a slow braised duck with a blah blah go do the blah blah blah. And I was like, what is this? It was incredible. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I, I only see the like I'm I am not at the level. The chef I worked for, uh, Greg Saunier was picked as one of the top 10 chefs in the United States in 1994 when I was working there and into 95. And uh, he, he's extraordinary. I had a, a meal there when I was there last November at Gabrielle and the food is just still stunning. So I'm like, a, I'm, a, I'm a really good, I can deliver a nice home meal. And I would, I've worked in restaurants for years and I cannot cook in restaurants. I find that stress. Yeah. Because everyone thinks they can do it at home, which we all can do a version yeah, of it, but, but people that. are hard on chefs and cooks, so I was like, I think I'm just going to do it for people who actually love me. Yeah. <laughs> or like, like and tolerate me, maybe. So that's my rule about cooking now, you know, for the most part. You got back to Peterborough, and the Union Theatre was happening, mm -hmm. and you would have been about, what, how old at this point? Maybe oh my God, so that's 1990, February 14th, 1992, so what, if I was born in 66, what does that make me? 26? Young enough. Just yeah. 26, is that, that makes it right? 26, I'm not. So that little spark that had happened yeah. at the Theatre Guild was still alive and well. And I had done theatre all through high school. Like, I'm not a singer, so at Adam Scott, I don't know if anybody remembers Adam Scott in the day, Darcy, you might, the Gilbert and Sullivan <coughs> Society, every two years they would do this massive GNS at, at the Adam Scott, which would be weird now because it was like the teachers and the students. Mm. So I remember... Mr. Paoli playing the love interest of a grade 13 student <laughs> in, uh, what's the one, I can probably, I'll think of the one it was, um, but it was like, I don't think any of that could happen now. <laughs> they, they would do them every two years, and they were incredible. My grade nine year was one of the years, one of the last ones, and it was just incredible. HMS Pinafore was the, the oh. last one. And, uh, but so I, I acted all through there, and in fact, in, in elementary school at Edmondson Heights, I was doing children's, I was directing children's plays, and then touring them mm -hmm. to other elementary schools. So That's was, amazing. I know I was directing these plays I would find. Yeah, they used to be budget. I remember my grade nine show too. We took it around. Like we thought we were, we had hit the road and we were in Norwood. And I was <laughs> like, this is amazing. Yeah, I think I went to Westmount. Like it was the big deal. Yeah, like, no. From Edmondson Heights to Westmount. It's the it gymnasium amazing. circuit. It's yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> and then of course you do the Sears Drama Festival and I got yeah. to start to direct at, at the end of 13. But yeah, for sure there was this hiatus period where I was kind of like longing and looking and, and it wasn't really working. And then, yeah, I, I came back to Peterborough to, to finish up at Trent and, and then discovered the Union mm -hmm. Theatre. So yeah. you wander into the Union and that's where you met Rob. Peterborough Examiner again on a Friday night, opening the Examiner was a little classified ad, people remember classifieds, <laughs> looking for an actress to be in George F. Walker's Criminals in Love at this Union Theatre. And I didn't even know where it was because it was on Hunter Street in an alleyway. So it took me a while to find it. And I had actually worked for, um, Hel does anybody remember Helen Hamilton and Costume King? Because I, Costume King used to be on Hunter and then it went on to George, right? Um, she was a she was a, a home ec teacher at one of the high schools. But I delivered balloonograms in high school for her. <laughs> They'd actually call me over at Adam Scott, Scott over the thing and say, you need to go, Mrs. Hamilton called, you need to go deliver a balloonogram. So I was a hero. French, we need some balloons. Yeah, French maid, gorilla. I would be living <laughs> balloonograms all over Peterborough in grade 13 in this van that my dad bought me. This, this like, is so uh, great. Like the van's a rock and don't come a knocking kind of van, like a really <laughs> weird van. Just Kim driving that kind of van. Yeah, and I remember seat. like... I was somewhere on Weller Street, and I had to, I was in a French made outfit with balloons. And I was, <laughs> nobody knows where I am if this goes south. Yeah, <laughs> if you get pulled over, you got a lot of splitting yeah. to do. Yeah, I, like, I hope this is all safe. Yeah. Yeah. So did, balloon animals will yeah. not be the first thing that comes to mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah, it's yeah. the great beginning so, of a play. Yeah. Um, so, what was it? so you wandered into the union. Did you get the role? Yeah. So the the best friend who works at Harvey's and is also a prostitute. And I actually went down to Harvey's, and because I've got that producer brain from right from the beginning, got Did you my research. I, well, I got the costume. They gave what do they call that? A uniform. No they got me the uniform, so I had it as a costume. And it was all these people. So it was um, the director was sort of talking about this guy that was starting this theater company, and they all knew each other from City Stage and from Rob doing the soaps. Those of you remember when Rob was doing the soaps, and yeah, and I didn't actually meet Rob for a couple months, but then I eventually 
met Robert, we were doing some auditions and workshops for this play that was going to happen at his family farm, uh, and the play was called The Cabin Blazers. And that was it. That was the beginning. It was 92. Yeah. And, Spring of 92. But when you guys arrived at the farm, because it was not a theater space, and yeah. it was Rob's mother had passed away, mm -hmm. he didn't know how to farm. It, he he had, didn't want to farm. I suspect yeah. that guy knows how to farm. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 like, he, he could write to. a lot about farming. Yes. <laughs> yeah. He can farm. I have but that no wasn't doubt. his destiny. That's he was right. in theater and had traveled across the country and suddenly needed to do to keep the farm, needed to do something, yeah. and had a vision, had already written the play, looked out and thought, we can do it here. Here's my motley band of fellow performers. Yeah. And how many of you were there? Yeah, so Rob was in Toronto with, working with Theatre Columbus doing 1492, this incredible play that I, I eventually saw it, it had more pink or more purple satin than I had ever seen on stage. <laughs> I think that was sort of like water. But he was, we went to see it. I had just, I actually met him then. And a few weeks later, myself and four others, yeah, four others, and a rototiller that somebody had rented. We went to his farm and <laughs> that we were going to build this big community garden and feed ourselves. I mean, very hippie. This is so yeah, 1992. Very yeah. hippie. Now, literally, just to tell you that I'll, I'll finish that one. There were about three carrots were got eventually at a <laughs> community garden. But I walked around the corner of what is now the barnyard that people know, uh, and the grass was really high, and there was discarded machinery and metal and big boulders, and it hadn't really been used since Rob, uh, since Rob's dad probably stopped far farming in the late seventies, late mid seventies yeah. when he passed away. And Alex, Alexis Gordon, who's gone now, handed me a pair of rusty uh, head sh shears, <laughs> and I was. I was just to cut grass. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, as long as the checks keep cashing, I will keep doing this, but nobody is going to come and, and watch anything here. Yeah, right. It's yeah. Just and the play was still being written. You know, we were doing workshops, and we, we like, I, I, like, I was suddenly, over those next few months leading up until the August opening of the Blazers, like, we were doing workshops with the Catholics, and I, you know, a couple things I said as Colleen McCarty, because I was a character, oh, yeah. are in there, you know, I, mark, I was looking at it today, marking, oh yeah, that's the line that I've said, must have said in some workshop, and yeah, I yeah. created this little tiny character that nobody else will notice in it, yeah. but yeah, we just uh, had no inkling that anything could possibly happen there, right. but he had seen it, you know, Rob, Rob's a visionary, he had seen the possibilities for that play. Yeah. Well, he's a visionary for sure, but so are you. And I think, I mean, the place would not exist the way it does today without you. And I've worked with you, and I see the vision, and you see when it happens to you. It's almost like working with Kim, an idea will float by, and you'll see her go, <laughs> like she grabs it. Like, no, I'll get it before it goes. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty incredible. So that year you brought up 1992, you were assistant stage manager, you created, you were... Uh, Colleen McCarty, one of the Catholics who was already living there. There were a number of Catholics already living in Cavan uh, before the, the migration was brought over by Justice McGuire. And so she's, she's in the fir uh, first and last scene of the first act and then multiple scenes in the second act where she's, she and her husband, uh, Charles, have moved to, um, to, the, with, to be with the rest of the Catholics in the settlement. And weren't you doing costumes as well? Yeah, I made a ton of the costumes. And I was also Robert's personal assistant. So right. I was Rob's assistant, the assistant stage manager, Colleen McCarty, and, and then I, I sewed a ton of costumes on And my head grass cutter. Yeah, yeah, just that one day. <laughs> just the one day. So the seats that were borrowed from bleacher seats from the Millbrook Fair. Yeah, the, the farmers would go down with the, the those things on the front of their tractors and bring those fair bleachers all the way from the you know along all the roads, Carveth and Houston, and bring them to out to us. I mean, the community was so supportive because Rob's a boy of the community and his family's been there since the 1850s. They, they were like, what's Robbie Winslow doing now? Oh, some crazy <laughs> thing out there, you know, all right. And, and I think that's why the theater's been so successful. I think if a group of hippies had arrived at that farm and, you know, with a, you know, opened up the back of a VW van and rolled out with the waft of marijuana, people would have been like, I'm sorry, who's it? what is going on here? But because Rob was of the place, yeah. there was an instant trust that he mm -hmm. would tell the stories with respect. Mm -hmm. right. And he did, you know, he did, I think we did, in, like, certainly in those early years when it was really Millbrook focused. Right. So what was that like then for your group when the audience, if you build it, they will come? What was that feeling when people <laughs> put their bums in the seats? Yeah, well, the first year was amazing. I mean, we were supposed to do six performances over two weekends to satisfy the Canada Council's exploration grant. They'd given the company $10,000. It wasn't even really a company then. It didn't have a name. The old poster, the original poster says the Cabin Blazers on it. And uh, 
And then when it, so, it sold out on, before we opened the first Friday, the first six sold out. And was, any, was anybody there that first year? 19? 1992. It's fine. It's okay. Uh, and then we're like, oh, I guess we'll add some weekends. And we actually, eventually added four more weekends. I was barefoot in the, out in the sort of the wet area by the pond in late mid-September <laughs> thinking, is this never going to end? <laughs> and then the journal, it was the last year for the journal on CBC, Paul Thompson, uh, had come out and he brought somebody from the journal so they did a big documentary on it which aired and so that was the fall of 92 it was kind of like oh well that that worked mm -hmm. I guess we should do something else I guess we should create something more yeah, yeah. so we, we gathered around I remember in my parents living room and started thinking about the name of the company obviously we should call it the fourth line because it was the fourth line that the theater was on until the next year when they changed to Zion line so now <laughs> it's the fourth line theater on Zion line <laughs> It can only happen after you sign those incorporation papers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah. yeah, right? And mission and mandates then were merged. And I think that I'm really proud of the fact that, you know, being part of establishing that original mission and mandate, we've never wavered from it in all these years. Yeah. It is the, it's the core of what we do. Either, yes, a project is solidly inside the mandate or it's outside the mandate, but we're doing it for these reasons. And the, uh, you've talked about that before, the idea that that mandate is a rudder for this ship, because it's a big ship. So when projects are, and you get approached a lot for projects, how do you measure what will be the next right thing for Fourth Line? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I think it's a bit of alchemy, so I'm not exactly sure I have a clear answer to it. You kind of know when you know, and we don't often get it wrong. We don't have a ton of projects that we're just like, well, let's just see. Let's have 15 or 20 things in the hopper, see what happens. We really strategically think that one would be good for us for this reason, or we've always wanted to do something on that, or well, we really like that playwright, or yeah, it's it is a bit of alchemy, and then it's about putting them together as well. So I'm not sure if I can be clear on how you know, but you kind of know, you know when you know. Mm -hmm. Well, and you have to think many years out. Yeah. Uh, for seasons. To 26 and 27 right now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. far. It's yeah. a long way to think, and you're kind of. You're adapting and adjusting to what's happening in the zeitgeist to try to mm -hmm. produce things that are what people are talking about. And within that as well, you have a mandate for yourself right now of um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and yeah. particularly involving women. Talk to me about that. Yeah. Well, as a woman who directs, there aren't necessarily a ton of them. Uh, certainly that's true 15 years ago, more mm -hmm. now. And certainly women don't get a lot of opportunity to to direct in this epic milieu that we have, you, you know, 50 actors, 30 actors. So the epic women's directing project is that a brainchild that comes out of that idea of giving women the opportunity to direct big mm -hmm. uh, and to direct at our space. And we have women, you know, so we have women who are directing for productions and assistant directing and apprentice directing and audit directing. There's all kinds of ways in mm -hmm. to that program. And then, you know, it's, it, there's been this incredible seismic shift around looking at uh, diversity, equity, and inclusivity. And so we really have, we have a responsibility to make sure that what we're reflecting on the stage, the stories, the playwrights, the actors reflect the makeup of this area and this country. Mm -hmm. So I feel really strongly about that. Yeah, I respect that a great deal. And particularly it's interesting because over 80% of the ticket buyers are women. So it's really interesting to start saying, well, isn't that interesting if we told our own stories a little bit? Yeah, women make 80% of the ticket arts ticket buying decisions in their households. Mm -hmm. Quite often, it's not. I'm sure it's not the husbands here. The men will be like, "Sorry, what are we going to?" You know, and the women have arranged the women have arranged the tickets weeks, and months in advance. In the old days, I, I spent a summer working in the box office. I think it was maybe '96, and the women would book the tickets, and then they'd want to know where they were going, and they'd hand the phone to their husbands for the directions. It was just a summer of this great thing. I was like, "Yeah," and now I'm going to tell the husband how to get there. Yeah. Gonna make the arts buying decision. So yeah. So, but I think as women, we've had to shift our brain. To not think the patriarchal, the, the men's lens is the only lens. I think we thought that for a long time. How could we not? That was what we were fed. Mm -hmm. And we think that quite often the, you know, so often plays, movies, whatever, watching are the hero's journey. That's one of the main stories mm -hmm. that, um, structures that we use in, in art, uh, in theater for sure. And so we kind of think of the men as the heroes, right? Mm -hmm. So now we have, what do they call it, sheroes? Sheroes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So So I'm always trying to think... Like a good example is this summer with the Kevin Blazers directing it and programming it and wanting to do it and put it with Darcy's play. Darcy Jenish is here. You guys can't see him if you're at home. But Dar and Darcy's written the world premiere of this play, but uh, the Toko Strike, and it's a women's story at, mm. at its heart. So it's about balancing, like when you're trying to program a season. So balancing, right. making sure that everyone's 
being included in the story. And represented in a yeah. way. Yeah. That's really cool. Well, in 2001, you were made, so 1992 was the first Cabin Blazers and the beginning of the journey. Mm -hmm. By 2001, you were made Artistic Associate, mm -hmm. and in 2014, you were appointed Managing Artistic Director. Oh. Did a little research. I know, you've got so many pages. It's like when people arrive with pages about you on a clipboard. <laughs> What's that? It's kind of weird, right? That I'm at home, like, watching <laughs> things and reading about you. I'm like, it's a bit creepy. Oh um, but these are some stats from Equity in Theater and Playwrights Guild of Canada. And women are still 35% employment marker as artistic directors or directors in plays. So you are holding that position that's predominantly occupied by men and you were doing it earlier than most men. How did that influence you or how, how was that being invited to the table or at the table, nudging your way into the table? Yeah. How did that influence the work you did or the way you did it? Well, I think I, once I've had, had sort of my own shift around thinking of myself as a feminist and thinking of myself as somebody who needed to make sure that we're championing women's stories as well as men's stories and all the stories um, and trying to maybe balance it a bit more, then it was like going out and looking for the stories, like mm -hmm. making sure we were getting women to write mm -hmm. at the theatre as much if we can as men and that there were as much equity as possible on stage between male characters and female characters in principal roles. Mm -hmm. What is that? What's that thing? Uh, the Hollywood test? The Betchel test? I don't know. Tell me more. It's the, it, so it, it looks at Hollywood movies in terms of are there more than one female character in a lead mm -hmm. role that do women talk to each other? Like, are there two characters who talk to each other about something other than a man? Right, right, right. There's all these tests. Like, it's like a, sn a smell test hmm. for art. Does it have women in real important yeah. roles? Because so often, you know, the women will have the idea, and then the man will suddenly swoop in and save the day. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So there's all this sort of stuff we have to be really aware of in terms of the actual thing in the, in the play. Mm -hmm. Are women actually represented? Mm -hmm. and our women's stories and the women's lens actually represented. Yeah, I, when I first met you, I knew of you, uh, because in 92 I was just a kid, Kim. And I, <laughs> I think you actually were just a kid, rascal. You were, was, she's protecting you. Know. I was going, about to go into high school, and yeah, yeah, when yeah. Fourth Line started, and I was just starting this like theater bug. Yeah. Same thing, theater guild, like, oh my god, this is amazing, and it's magic, and you show up, and the set is built, and you're like, <gasps> it's like playing in your basement, but with real things, like, it's incredible, and uh, and the whole joy of it now in my adulthood is I still get to be that child who gets to play, I play for a living, it's called a play, who gets to do that, um, and I met you when I was in my early 20s, and I was totally intimidated, for a hundred reasons, because you were um, really smart, visionary um, you'd have these big ideas I was so afraid of failing or letting you down <laughs> and you were a boss lady before I saw examples of like boss ladies mm -hmm. and so it was scary to me um, and now having worked with you it's like my mentor of like channel your inner Kim Blackwell <laughs> like you can own this room and I think you've been that for a lot of women so I just yeah. oh, thank thanks. you for that I think it was really hard in the early days people didn't know what to make of it mm -hmm. Uh, and there's so lots of missteps and lots of disbelief in it. And also, women have had, I say this a lot to women that I'm working with, women emerging leaders. We used to just have male leaders and male bosses to replicate. And I'm just going to tell you right now, nobody's going to tolerate a woman coming into the room like a man comes into the room. Mm -hmm. You know, with that kind of power or, uh, or whatever it is, the, the masculinity, that, that's not going to cut it. So women have had to, and I had to find a different way of being a women, woman boss that would A, still, I would have my integrity with me and that I would be allowed to, mm -hmm. to lead. I think the thing for me is that I am not afraid to make the decision. That's the biggest thing, mm -hmm. I make the decisions. Like, the buck does stop with me often, mm -hmm. and, I, and that's sometimes shocking for people. Mm -hmm. And also, I, even though I, I don't love it, I will have the difficult conversations with people. The really hard bits of leadership are around those two things, and then, and then people being angry with you. And, you know, I'm a, like I am still an artist, and so, and I'm, I'm quite, um, not soft isn't the word, but I, I'm an emotional person, so it's hard to know people are angry with me. That it, it takes a, uh, it takes a toll on my psyche. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it's about all of that wrapped together in the swirling morass yeah. of, of <laughs> leadership. Yeah, it's hard. But you, I, I admire as well, for over the last few years, you've even been taking, um, you're, you're really deeply engrossed in personal growth. 
and you constantly want to both improve the company and yourself and your staff. And you've been working with an executive um, coach as yeah. well to become keep honing your leadership skills. And a lot of people, 30 years at a company, don't they think like I got this? But you are constantly sort of um, evolving, and and it's showing in the company too. I, and in your own work, like you're now going to be a playwright, and you were scared to be a playwright first. So tell me about that. Yeah, I had a, I had a couple of ideas for things <clears throat> for years, and I run a theater company, and I didn't even know that I could try it. Isn't that weird? <laughs> I didn't know I could try it, and then I didn't know. So then when I tried it, it was the uh, early days. Let us go back three years to <laughs> April and May of 2020, locked in our houses. I feel like something happened. Yeah. yeah. That was it? Yeah, no. yeah. I was in my house in Scarborough then, it's before we moved back to Peterborough, and we had a really tiny house in Scarborough. And there was nothing to do. It was my husband and my daughter and I, and those walls for whatever it was, the, all the waking hours of the day. And uh, I finally had no excuse but to try to write something. So I had this idea for, for the play of a daughter, which is about family estrangement. I'm really fascinated by family estrangement. Mm -hmm. For a number of reasons. First of all, if you talk to anybody about it, almost everyone has estrangement in their families, and uh, and then I have only one. I have one daughter, and I imagined a situation where she uh, would cut me off, right. and how horrifying it would be because I adore her. So I started to write. I started to write this play. It was a monologue about from the mother's point of view, and then I gave it to my friend Maya Ardell, who's a, a trusted <coughs> writer and dramaturge friend, and she said. Lots of really positive and supportive and, and other interesting comments about it. And she said, but I think you're missing the daughter voice. Like, I think she had the daughter. I was like, what? Well, what would the daughter have to say? It's so outrageous to cut your mother off. How can you? <laughs> <laughs> so then I had to go out and talk to people who had cut their parents off. And I was like, oh, okay. Right. So then I ended up writing this two-hander for the mother and the daughter. They're on stage together, but they never interact about this estrangement. And, uh, and then I didn't know what to do with it. And actually, Rob said, and Rob's been a great mentor to me over the years, Rob said, well, why don't we do a reading at the, at the theater? Mm -hmm. And this is where, you know, as a woman leader, I still have a long way to go. Oh, yeah, like I give playwrights a chance to have their plays read all the time and <laughs> pay artists. I can do that. Yes, I can. Yeah. So I did. And was the fear, was it just a block that you thought, oh, that's not what I normally do? Or was it a fear of like, like the BFA, like a failure thing? Was it a fear of like, yeah. what was it, was, it? it was probably not, no, I think it just hadn't even occurred to me. It mm -hmm. hadn't even occurred. It's probably part of what some women struggle with. And I know I'm <clears throat> leery about this term, but a bit of posture, imposter syndrome-y, like how many plays do you have to write to, to then be considered a playwright? I, mm -hmm. I remember in the early years when I was a great stage manager and I was an excellent stage manager, but I wanted to direct and people were like, stay in your lane. Like, don't yeah. get out of your lane. And it happens to women a lot. I think it happens to all of us. Mm -hmm. Don't get out of your lane. But women especially, don't get out of your lane. And, and I, it's never quite been good enough for me, and I mm -hmm. want women to get out of their lane. Shelly Simmerster, who's assistant directing me this summer, has never directed, but she called me. She goes, I'd love to assist and dress. I was like, yes, come and assist mm -hmm. and direct. You absolutely should. You mm -hmm. should do that. I, I want people to, to know that you can be across many lanes. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I guess that's partly why. I just didn't think I was my lane, and I didn't think I had anything to say. I didn't know if I could write. Mm -hmm. And I'm still a baby writer, so I, I use that caveat, but I, I certainly understand the structure of a play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I did have something to say, and then I was, at the same time, Lindy, our general manager, and I had already decided to write a Halloween show together before the pandemic hit. And so I was able to blast my half of that play out, and I'm, I'm proud of my work in that and that collaboration. So then, I don't know, it was... Probably into maybe we were in Delta in 21, the Delta strain, and locked away again. And I thought, I can write something for the farm. Mm. Like for the summer season. I've given tons of people the opportunity to write for the big house. Why am I not giving myself that yeah. chance? So that's what I'm doing. And, and I'm obsessed with the little cemetery on Zion Line as you're coming from Centerville uh, Church. Have you passed? You know that the little one up on the hill? cemetery? If you keep. Come right down Zion Line, fourth line, straight through, and there's a little cemetery there. And especially if you hit it at sunset, oh my gosh, it's like the sun sets perfectly through the window of the chapel. It's unreal. St. Paul's, I've stopped I think so St. Paul's times. Anglican Church and Cemetery. So, yeah, I had this idea for this play about um, Ma my daughter Maud and I stopped there once. Uh, I think it was summer of 19. We had a little picnic off to the side, and I was walking around and I was watching the gravestones disappearing into the ground once there's nobody to care for them or the ravages of time and, and weather were making the names disappear mm -hmm. and I had this visceral reaction these people are disappearing 
and we're not going to know who they are anymore. And then it's, you think about mortality and legacy and what do you leave. And so I became really obsessed with exploring that cemetery and the lives of the people in there and, and who are disappearing. Um, so that's what I'm working on right now. Yeah. I think we'll have light things in it too. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very dark. But. Yeah. No, yeah, you've, I've read, read some of the scenes you've yes. been creating. We've been doing a writer's group. We meet on, even on Zoom and write. It's just accountability, really, to force each other. Because there's nothing more intimidating than the blank page. <laughs> oh, wow, this one here, she's an incredible one to have with. Oh, God, you stare at it, it and you're like, oh my gosh. This is a great time to do my laundry. <laughs> Anything but this yeah. page. Well, I'm, I'm a procrastinator, so this is a little Kim secret. Are you? Oh, the worst for myself. My own projects myself. I would write a grant for someone else in a second and not do it for myself. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, I'm a terrible procrastinator, so the, the, the writing meetings are great. Uh, yeah. You're work. prolific. Like, I'll get a paragraph out, and Kim's like, I've got to, I just did in that 20 minutes, I did five pages. I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's not true. That's not true. Yeah. Um, so, this year, though, sees the Cabin Blazers, Green oh, Mountain. So, yeah. you, 92, you were an actor stage manager. In 2004, you directed. 93 actor stage manager as well. Okay. And then 96 actor. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then, I guess, 2004 was the next time. Yeah. And now it's so tw almost 20 years later. 19 years ago, like a generation ago I directed it. Yeah. It is wild to think that 2004 is a generation. Like that is just all close as that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I couldn't, there I, was going to be I was going through play. IVF then. <laughs> yeah. I hadn't had my kid yet. You know, she wasn't yeah. born for two more years. She's now 17. Like it's all really. So how does all of that, that 19 years, uh, how is that going to influence the way you're looking at the play now? Um, and how, how do you divorce yourself from what you did before and come at it with fresh eyes? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, in 2004, I had this whole, remember Martin Scorsese's Gangs of New York was big then? Yeah, and yeah. So we did a kind of a Gangs of New York meta thing. The two sides were different colors and sort of like uh, Bill the Butcher top hats. And so it had a real Gangs of New York feel to it. So that's not going to be what it is. This one's going to be Jets and Sharks. It's going to be a <laughs> side story. <laughs> Kevin Blazer's the music. Exactly. <laughs> well, talk to Robert about that. That's great. <laughs> so, you know, I I think I I want to explore Maguire's journey. I'm very interested in Patrick Maguire's journey. I have a beginning, an idea for the beginning of it to uh, explore that. And I'm a bit of a director who always puts a little of my own thing in a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I have this idea of a, a bit of a beginning to the beginning. So we'll see. We're restaging it. So we've, we've always staged it in that alley. Anyone who's seen the Cabin Blazers, there's always people on both sides in an alleyway. But we are in a climate crisis. And uh, the people who were sitting on the east side looking west in 2011, it was simply too hot to sit there without covering. Mm -hmm. So we are, we are move, we're keeping the staging the way it is. And so the orientation of the whole thing will be different than people have seen before, which I'm excited to play with. Mm. And in some ways, it won't change a ton because what's great, there's so many great things about the Cabin Blazers. One of them is it is a great community play. And so mm -hmm. for the 50 people who've never done it before, and it is 50 people in it That's right insane. now, uh, including a what will then be nine-month-old baby, mm -hmm. uh, at least one, if not two, if I can find another one. I'm looking for a baby, by the way. <laughs> looking for a second baby. It will be an opportunity to really work in the beautiful community professional mix that is at the heart of what we do at Fourth Line. So, you know, Jack Nicholson and Colin Doyle and wonderful professional actors from Toronto, and then this amazing group of volunteers who will spend up to 170 hours working to bring our show to life. I mean, it's an amazing thing what how the community has embraced what we do out there for so long and how they've given of themselves in mm -hmm. so many ways mm -hmm. to the theater. So I'm excited just to explore it, and I'm excited to, to show that play to a new generation mm -hmm. of people. I mean, there are people who were not born who would now be in university who will see it. Mm -hmm. And there are people who, uh, I was talking to somebody recently who bought the first two tickets to the Kevin Blazers in 92, and he'll be there mm -hmm. to see it. And, and my dad, who's now 88, who was there the first year, he'll come and see it. So yeah. it's, it's, there's something really wonderful about, it's not a museum piece, but it is, it is a testament to the legacy and the staying power of the theater, the Kevin Blazers. Yeah. Are there anyone, Rob's going to be in it? Yeah, Rob's never played Justice uh, John Nolson, mm -hmm. so he's the second Justice, uh, he's sort of uh, Patrick McGuire's uh, friend, 
second justice, so Robert wanted to play that role this year. I mean, he kind of could have played any role he wanted. So. Is there anyone else from the original cast that's going to be in this other than Rock? I don't think so. Am I getting that wrong? I don't think so. Lots that's of them cool. passed on, yeah, but a whole new generation. And <clears throat> it is weird when we were thinking about doing this talk now. I have had a 31-year relationship with someone else's play. Right. And I don't know what other artist and artistic director has had basically a lifelong relationship deep relationship with this play. I have my own experiences. My grandpa was an orange man, mm -hmm. um, all Saints Church. He marched in every orange parade um, mm -hmm. up till the day he died here in Peterborough, uh, that sum last summer before he died. And I remember s we were so Protestant and there was this anger about the Catholics and this mm -hmm. hatred. And so I came into it knowing it. Mm -hmm and having some lived experience with it. So it's a play that really resonates for me. And it also just talks about those, those fights around the world where people look exactly the same, mm -hmm. in Yugoslavia, uh, in Rwanda, and yet some happenstance of birth makes them see each other as enemies and so different. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the really important piece that lives in me around the Catholic Blazers, around tolerance, around understanding. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Now you're saying you're looking for a baby. There's not enough time for any of us to have one for you. <laughs> but I always find that an interesting thing when I see the casting calls or what fourth line is looking for, because it's like we're, you'll, you'll put out an ad of <laughs> open your open your paper on the weekend. The fourth line needs a caravan. Okay. <laughs> I need a camper. I they do. Need I a camper found van. Need they one. need a baby and two goats. So oh, that's interesting. I wonder what they're up to. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, we will always, <laughs> our first rule is, used to be to go to the cabin dump first and yeah. see if we can find what we needed there. The cabin Kmart is what they like to call it where we are. And then we started, when eBlast came about, we started asking our audience yes. for things that we needed. Because we don't have a, a gazillion dollars and what we try to do is so epic with so little. And our audience is amazing how yeah. they will reach out to us when we wanted quilts for the Real McCoy. People gave us their old quilts, and I, yeah. every once in a while we'll pull them out when people are cold and the funny June weather. They're like, oh, yeah, there's one of the Real McCoy quilts. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, it is really neat, and it is, I think that's what makes Fourth Line so special, and part of why it has lasted for so long as well is because it is not just a company doing something, it is a community, both in it, you're on the stage, you're helping run the theater, you're, it, it's all of the pieces of the puzzle. And interestingly, from the first Cabin Blazers, it was Emily Spassoff, right? Who was yes, the second baby. one, second Cabin Blazers, second 93. One, 93. Yeah, yeah. She was the baby in the play. And then this past September, she now has her PhD, et cetera, and she got married at the farm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's right. And she met Ken, her now her husband, husband, at the He farm. was on horseback as one of the yeah. Blazers. No, he was in uh, St. Francis of Nobrook. Right. Yeah, she met he was horseback. Side. Yeah, he did for yeah. sure in the 2011 Literally production. Literally like riding up to her on horseback. Oh, it's ridiculous. Yeah, so cute. Yeah. <laughs> But I want to tell me a little bit because we talk about Mother Nature and um, oh my lord, I know it's great. <laughs> you have to the difference though with with Fourth Line and it's not a proscenium or a black box theater, so you can think way outside the black box. Mm -hmm. um, so you have this huge vista, which is wonderful, but it's kind of intimidating, like the blank page of I guess I should have people come out of a pond then. <laughs> so how do you manage that? And you're doing it balancing nature, and you've had some great stories with some livestock, maybe <laughs> Annie the goat. Like maybe you could tell us a little bit about some of that experience. Yeah, well, you know, weather obviously is the number one thing. I don't talk about it too much. We all know it's tough and it's changed. Weather has changed, right? So we're very aware of the weather all the time and trying to get those shows in. <clears throat> we do our best to safely get every show in. So I'm so fascinated what's going to happen in the next five or ten years with weather. Yeah, it's a very interesting time. I find it really bonding, having been in a couple of shows out there. When with the audience, I feel like one when when yeah. I see everyone in their ponchos, <laughs> and we're all like, we are doing this together. <laughs> or you see everyone with like uh, frozen sponges on their chests or the top of their head, and you're like, I Thank love you. all of you Thank for doing you for this. Doing that. Yes, you just feel yes. this deep yeah. love. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it, so there's so many variables. There's the, the, you know, the hot air balloon that rises up and distracts everybody, but someone's decided they want a balloon ride in the middle of a show. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, the that looks good over there. Right here, you're distracting. Yeah. Or the planes that fly. We're so constantly, I'm calling the control 
thing at the Peterborough Airport, please divert the planes. And they're like, like you actually have to call Transport Canada to do that, lady. Yeah. And I'll just be like, well, we're just down for theater. And <clears throat> you're coming over, and it's just too loud, and everybody stops listening, and they look up, and yeah. oh my gosh. And then, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I had Kim a, hates I had a no- chipmunks, by the way. Oh. <laughs> they're her least favorite. Because she's like, a cute little chipmunk runs across, and the actor's like, oh wow. She's like, no, everyone stops and looks at the chipmunk. Yeah, well, guaranteed. <laughs> Look at yourselves next time, and one where somebody's doing a deep scene on stage, and the chipmunk runs. Oh, look at that chipmunk! <laughs> <laughs> They've also stolen a lot of my food. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I have water bottles chewed off. And yeah, and she, like them. one time, a chipmunk tried to steal one of my stickling seven grain sticks. <laughs> and Justin Hiscox watched it try to put it through a hole this size. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's. Uh, but there's also magical moments um, with uh, with animals as well, like. Uh, Bo Dixon told this story, so of Justin Hiscox, where he was doing the song about the swallow, yeah. and a, uh, he's standing up on the little music parapet, and a swallow literally came and sat next to him. He just stopped and looked at it, and he's like, the whole audience oh. noticed. It was just this beautiful, special. You couldn't have planned it. Well, and what are the chances that we would live next door, that the theater would would survive more into its fourth decade next door to a guy who has homing pigeons and yeah. races and trains them? So everyone's probably be like, we could have pigeons be released in this scene. Yeah, <laughs> let's drive over to Jerry's. Let's get some pigeons, and so we've done it. Like and in St. Francis of Millbrook, the pigeons were released early. They were released in the first scene on opening night, and I actually left the stands with the PA. We went to Jerry's barn, <clears throat> got a whole new bunch of pigeons. <laughs> I then ran around and I hid in the field in my dress on my belly, and I released the pigeons <laughs> for the end of the first act when they were supposed to come out from under the actor's like big robe he was wearing. <laughs> I remember chasing Spot the pig. He got out of his enclosure. We were trying to put a pig in the second year in the Moody Trail. As you do. Out at the back site. If anybody ever see anything out at that back site, we had the cabin. I'm going to resurrect that someday. I'm making that a promise. For the 40th, all right? I'm just, I'll okay. say it now. Say it now. Mm-hmm. And the pig got out. And we were doing cabin blazers during the day. And the pig got out in the evening. And it was <laughs> underneath some of those bleachers. And, and I'm under there thinking. I think the pig was humongous. I'm thinking I could put my arms around the pig. <laughs> And get it back into its enclosure. <laughs> How'd that go, Kim? It did not go well. <laughs> and I, that pig was never seen again. I, I, that pig succumbed to some <laughs> creatures. And then I would get this, I had this little two-door Renault in, is that a nine? Yeah, 92 as well, 93. I'd pick it up at Bob Stevens Farm up on goat. County Road 10. Yeah, she was a April, a morbidly April. obese goat. <laughs> And I'd put her into the back of my two-door Renault, like I'd push her into the back seat. And I'd drive down the old rail bed to the Moody Trail site because we had this goat that was called for in the play. And then I'd put her back in my Renault, drive her back, I'm sure illegally, along the old rail tracks. Yeah. They eventually, they locked that up. Because of out. you in April. Yeah. <laughs> we, a lot of, we were using that as a quick way to get to that back site. Yeah, poor April the goat. And then I'd have a little kid sitting beside me and... Some of the goats start eating the kids' straw hats. Like, get the stop. <laughs> but who's putting a you know a morbidly obese goat into the back of their two door room? Yeah, no, that's. See, that leads me into the next one though. To okay. stay thirty years somewhere, there has to be something different about a place. Mm-hmm. So, what is it about Fourth Line for you that has that you've decided to dedicate so much of your life to? Yeah, well, I, I don't know if everyone who's here and watching from home or wherever agrees, I think it's a little bit of magic in heaven. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when I've looked at taking other jobs at other theaters, because they've come up and people have come knocking, and I, I can't think of a place and a mandate and an experience that I have that melds my love of theater with my love of history, because I have my degree in history, and my love of stories and people. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, it just melds it all perfectly. And then, we are the only theater company in this country that has that uh, professional community mix on mm-hmm. stage. So my love of community theater from the Theater Guild all those years ago is, is fulfilled there. The professional part of me is fulfilled. The, the, and, and then the epic, like it's just, it's everything. So when I look at any other job, I, can't, I have the best job <laughs> in the country, I think, mm-hmm. in the arts. I'm very blessed to be one of a handful of people in this area that makes a professional living off of my art. I mean, really, that is uh, unbelievable. And so it kind of, it's, it's everything. Mm-hmm. It's everything there. And the mandate is so important to me. And I, I, 
trust it with my life and believe in it. Um, even when we might do something that's outside the mandate and try something new, whether it works or not, I just believe in that mandate. And to have sat down in one community for now into our fourth decade and told the stories of a place mm -hmm. is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And so we now have this body of work about this place. And I always say, when you get really specific, like the specificity of the story of a telephone operator from Garden Hill mm -hmm. has national echoes. Mm -hmm. The more specific you get, the more universal the thing can become. And mm -hmm. I think that's one of the beauties of what we do. So what are you itching to do now? Where, what are you, it does not sound to me like at 30 years you're going, well, that's enough. I'm bored. Like if you're itching no. to do more, and where do you see Fourth Line going? What do you hope and dream for it? Well, in some ways, just keep doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Like if it's if it ain't fixed, if it ain't broken, don't, don't fix it. And thank you. Fixed, and we got to come out of this pandemic and get everyone back in the seats so that we, you know, one of the things when I I meant to mention earlier when other theater companies have come knocking is they the and I've worked at Canadian Stage and other places and you're always having these marketing bums and seats conversations which are brutal. We rarely, touch wood, have to have bums and seats conversations because we've typically sold out for, for decades. We've sold out. Our audience is so loyal and we have the best audience in this country, mm -hmm. bar none, I always say that. So I don't really want to have bums and seats conversations. But I think we're at an opportunity time now, coming out of the pandemic, to make sure that we fill the house again so I'm not afraid of the challenge of that. Mm -hmm. I want, to, I want to keep telling the stories of this area. I want to reflect the country as much as we can. And uh, with DEI, I want to shepherd women and young people. I mean, the number of, I mean, it's probably in the thousands now of young people who've come through the theater as volunteers. Some have gone on to theater careers and, and arts careers, but some haven't. And all of it is mm -hmm. great. And I see, I think you know this, I talk about the transformative power of the theater to change the world and to change people's lives. So at its core, my, my artistic practice and my beliefs are about transformation, mm -hmm. that art can be an agent to transform. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it happen before my eyes at Fourth Line mm -hmm. and a, a bazillion times. And so I want to keep doing high quality work mm -hmm. that is uh, honors the community. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I'm going to keep doing. I'm going to write a play. I know. I'm going to keep directing plays. What do you hope that your legacy has been? Oh my gosh. That's, that's a big one. Well, I guess that, that people have a really soft spot in their heart, in their belly, in their mind for something they saw at Fourth Line that impacted them. Some play, I was walking back from David French's that summer once. We did a this, um, play set in the uh, cottages on, on mm -hmm. Lake Simcoe in 2005. We did it at a little site, just a little bit back, and it was all the music of that time, of the 1950s, and the play, and Bo and Justin and Mark had created this little band, and it was about young love in the 50s, and I was walking behind two women, and they just sighed, and they're, oh, I'm gonna go home, and I'm gonna get all the old records out, and mm. the other one said, oh, to be in love like that again. Mm. Wow. And so those moments in print on me, mm. and taking, and really respecting our audience, Mm. And, the, and the experience and journey they have at the theater and, and the shows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so some of that, some of that. I mean, that relationship between art and audience is so interesting to me and so important. Mm -hmm. And it's a delicate balance, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I love exploring that. Love, that's why we, we put our plays in front of audiences early to see what their reaction is in readings and, and what have mm -hmm. you, because that interplay that exchange of energy. It's kinetic, yeah. Yeah, well, and you know, you've been out there now. Mm -hmm. There's no hiding, there's no fourth wall. So <laughs> if someone is bored, you will see them asleep. Yes, you will. <laughs> they cannot yes, be hidden. And you know, people eating their chips, and they have, some of them don't have any idea how loud that chip bag is. <laughs> or the, the nervous person who's cracking the water bottle, and you're like. <laughs> <laughs> you're so right. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how much more time we have. Well, we have about, you know, 10, 10 15 okay. minutes. Yeah. Um, so what then has, we've talked about the idea that it, um, theater can be transformative. And because it's local, often the people who are in, the plays might be written about someone and they're there. So there's a 
potency to that. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with that and making sure that people are okay with you telling their stories? Sometimes I'm really scared of it. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I recently talked to one of the daughters, it's okay to talk to Darcy's play, uh, one of the daughters of one of the owners of mm. the Tilco plant. And, you know, Darcy's play, the lens is, it, is very much about the workers. That's the lens the piece is taken in lots of ways. The, all three owners are very involved in it. And one of them is a little bit more exaggerated or a little bit more high, hot under the collar. The other two are great. And so I was able to talk to her about this really painful time in her life mm -hmm. and how Darcy's honored her dad and his memory really beautifully. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so sometimes it's really scary. I remember, uh, I guess I can say names. Well, I won't say names, but the bank manager's daughter reached out to us during the, um, before we had opened the first year of the Battle of Bank Robbers and was so upset that we were doing the play. And so immediately, I just always am convinced someone's going to sue me. Yeah. So I'm like right on the phone to a copyright lawyer. I was like, what does it all mean? And, and then she actually came the second year and loved it. And you know, th there's a great example of, of being really sensitive and mindful in our work. We don't want to make anybody, we don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. We yeah. tell tough stories a lot of the time. We do it with, uh, with as much integrity and honesty as we can. In the Bad Luck Bank Robbers, the bank robbers' uh, sons and nephews came to see it the second year. I mean, it's crazy. the police officers came, bank employees came, and they all loved it. And I thought, well, there's a playwright and a theater company kind of getting it right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. yeah, it's hard. And it's hard, like I know for myself, researching for the next play I'm writing, mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of people with a lot of stake and, uh, in the story, and you feel this deep pressure to create something that other people can ha see themselves in or have ownership of. And it's a, it's a difficult thing to do, to create art in your own community. Yeah, well, and I think because I've dramaturged for so many people and because I'm... That Can you explain what dramaturging is? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows what Nobody it is. Nobody knows what it is. It's a made-up term. What? Uh, it's like being a literary manager or an editor in some ways. So you, you support the playwright to develop the best possible play they can. Mm -hmm. Darcy, what do you think? How would you define it? You've had me dramaturge for you. Yeah, well, I, like I said in my talk, is that each new draft and each round of revisions, I can see something better emerging. And as a writer, you can't ask for more than that. And we can, my supervisor can add this, drop that, and then yeah. we can have a line edit. So it's been great. It's a yeah, concept. yeah. So I, I, I really go into the world of the play. I believe the characters are real. I believe the whole thing is real. It comes from that theater guild, seeing myself in that makeup mm -hmm. all those years ago. So I just ask the questions like they're real people. And so if they do something confusing that doesn't seem to track with something else, I'll ask that question. So it is about just supporting the playwright as around that. Also to sort of let the playwright not have to worry. There's a lot of noise around the high stakes shows. Mm. There's a lot of people with invested interest, I think with the Bernardo children. Uh, I'm working right now with Alison Lawrence on a play about the Farmerettes. And we did, just did this reminiscence um, two weekends ago in Kitchener. And between being online and the room, 150 people came out, including 16 farmerettes who raised, ranged in age from 92 to 98. That's amazing. <laughs> Some of them drove themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and so being very aware of Allison's play, not letting too much of the noise of that come in and let her write the play she needs to write. I try to do that with a lot of people, you know, mm -hmm. just say, can I, can I kind of walk in front of you and do a little bit of interference so you can just write. You have a great line that Kate, uh, Kate Starr and I um, worked with Kim on the brand society and a few times we've worked on brand of stuff with you, but Kim's got this great line. Um, she, can I make an offering is what she'll say. So she's looking at the script and it's instead of going, oh, this is <laughs> or can I make this edit? She'll look, can I just make an offering? I think where you said this, it's pretty terrible. Um, <laughs> so we've stolen that line know. now. Darcy, are you familiar with this? Can I make an offering? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's so great. I use it with my boyfriend now. It's awesome. <laughs> Can I make an offering? Um, but it's such a gentle, beautiful way to create something together. Sorry. That's my boyfriend. He's really upset. <laughs> um, it's a great way to create something together, uh, but it has respect for what we have done. But you set this, you set the, you create a healthy soil that we're not afraid to go, okay, well, I'm going to throw another thing in there and see if it grows. Uh, I think that's what you do really well, and I hope you see that that, oh, I might cry. I hope you see that's part of your legacy. 
Because I think you, we, oh my god, that's embarrassing. <laughs> It's hard because we're actually friends, but <laughs> but I think you know we joke that the farm grows people, but it does. Mm. Yeah, we grow plays on Rob's farm, right? Like other farms have. But crops. you grow humans. Yeah, like people have been raised there, mm. like your daughter, like my daughter. So yeah. what was that like? Because she's now, I don't know, forty-two. How old is she? <laughs> Seventeen years old, 17. and she was raised on the farm. Well, you know, I'll just say this about that. What an incredible blessing I feel that she got to be with me every summer. So mm -hmm. when I when I worked in the summers, which are long, grueling hours, it's 24-7, she was there with me. And from the time she was four, she was in play. So she's grown up in and around it. I always wanted to, I wanted her to know that I wasn't just her mom, that I was a, a person with my own art practice and my own needs and business life and all that. So she's seen that <laughs> a lot. <laughs> And, and so, because she's had to make lots of sacrifices for the, the theater. Mm -hmm. We've never had a summer vacation till last summer. I took the final season of the summer off. I've never done that. And, and we went to France, and thank God Lindy and the team were allowed us to do it. But she's never had a summer vacation. Mm -hmm. You know, never had really, you know, weeks at the cottage like some kids will get. So it's been incredible that I didn't have to put her in daycare and that she could be there. Mm -hmm. uh, I've made a couple of missteps with her in the shows. I... We were. She was in the second year of the Right Road to Pontypool. Alex Pontypool was playing. Alex directed the Bad Luck Bank Robbery. I should have said that as well. But she was in a scene. She was four, and um, the actress playing her mother had just lost one of her kids to the Spanish flu. Mm -hmm. Who knew? We'd be dealing with our own version of that. And the mom collapses on the ground and starts to wail and scream. And my daughter, just with abject fear and terror, starts to cry and rushes up to me in the stands. And I was like, oh my God, I am the worst mom. On the <laughs> like, what am I doing putting her in this rehearsal of this scene? And then the actress was traumatized. I was like, okay, Rob, she's going to be fine. It's all going to be fine. And so then I was like, we have to break this down and make this play. So we just started with the actress collapsing on the ground. Right. Because what Maude had to do was then get down with her mom and, and sort of like rub her on there and say, mama, mama, so that the, the mom could be reminded that even though she lost one of her daughters, there were the other children that she needed to raise. And so we just built it up. So it's about learning, like, especially because we work with kids so often, how do you have kids involved in your shows? Mm -hmm. And one of the things is not to traumatize them like I did with my daughter. But, <laughs> but by the end, she was on stage for the, that whole month of that run with the actors collapsing and screaming and wailing. And she could do that thing, and it, it, it was all play. It was make-believe. Yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, she'll be in therapy someday going, it was 1917, oh. and my mom, <laughs> wait, let me I get this no notes right. Doubt. I have no <laughs> doubt she'll be in therapy. And then suddenly it was 1850, and I don't even know who I am. <laughs> I know, oh my gosh. Well, you have an incredible team at Fourth Line, yes. including some folks here today, Lindy and, and Emma's Emma, here. thank you for helping put today together. Yeah. Um, and I just want to have you finish before, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions so anyone has questions, so start thinking. But, um, Finish this sentence for me. Okay. To me, fourth line means fourth line mean to me, fourth line means magic. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kim Blackwell. Thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Now does anyone have any questions? Yes. Speaking of bums in the seats. <laughs> Sold out a lot. Not right now. Nothing is sold out right now. Get your tickets. Have there been any talk about expanding seating capacity at the farm? Yeah, yeah, we have talked about it before. We're really trying to not do that mm -hmm. because we want to maintain the intimacy mm -hmm. of the place. Mm -hmm. If we started, you know, we, we just had this pandemic which completely upturned our world, basically mm -hmm. closed for 20. Uh, thank God we had the Veranda Society in 21, uh, reopened last year to much smaller houses than, than we had had before that. So it would be a really good problem to have and think about, but there is just something about get your tickets early and be in that intimate experience. We've actually, we've lost, uh, we've lost 30 seats in the house because I don't know if you all heard, we have new seats at the Fourth Line Theater. I should have brought one for the people who are here. They're really beautiful, but they're just slightly a bit bigger. Um, but it's a, we have thought about it for sure. It's just. But right now the answer is no. 
I take that. Yeah, it's okay. that's my long-winded, kind way of saying not right now, no. Well, actors aren't liked either, so once you yeah. add so much more, and then when it's a windy day, oof, yeah. you are working against those elements. Yeah, and we're trying to avoid the mic. I mean, yeah, we that's like what to, I mean. We like to work try to brand of society. And good for that. That's what makes it so interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's got true. it's got crazy. The, the acoustics, especially in the barnyard, are crazy. Depend, mm. you know, there is a place where you cannot turn up stage this way. Huh. Your voice will just get sucked between the big barn and the audience uh, costume barn. Nobody will hear you. There, it, actors have to learn it, and it has a bit of a operatic presentational thing. We actually have to talk out and then look at your scene partner and huh. talk out. Yeah. Yeah. So it is a. It does take a while to get used to it, and it is a bit of a thrust. A, I call it a mini thrust. So you have to be aware of it's not just a proscenium, and in fact, because you've got the green bleachers, you have to open it like kind of like this to everyone. It is a. It's mm -hmm. a peculiarly specific. It really is. Mm -hmm. It does make you go back into your theater school days, which is the interesting part when you start rehearsals too for those, uh, for some folks in the community who've never done a play. It's a really interesting mm -hmm. space to kind of cut your teeth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but thank you. It's good. I, look, if we get to that, we'll be getting in touch with you. Yeah. Uh, standing <laughs> and uh, we'll mic them all and we'll make it 2006. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Could you tell me when did you first do the great career? Was it 93? No, it was 95 was the Farini. Okay. Might have been 94. The summer of the way, it was 94. 95 was Winslow's. So it was 1994 was the great Farini, Sean, Shane Peacock's play. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't I get to see uh, I remember seeing that thing on the journal about Four Frontier and We had nothing at the end of 92. <laughs> and so we, when we were sitting around coming up with the name and like, okay, I guess this worked. We should do something else. We, uh, Robert and three other playwrights madly got together and quickly threw together the, the Moody Trail, the, the Catherine Partail and Susanna Moody play out at the back site. And that was a flurry to get the play done. I mean, they were still on the roof. Uh, we made this, um, it's about a mile back in the bush, there's a National Amphitheater, we made this log cabin, the whole front wall opened, because I pushed it many times as a, an assistant <laughs> stage manager on that show. Uh, the guys were still like, had chainsaws on the roof as the audience was arriving for the first performance. <laughs> it was wild. Yeah, so we didn't have anything. And then uh, I went away, I, so I wasn't there in 94 but I'm imagining that that Robert that Shane probably reached out to Robert with an idea for a, a, a stage adaptation of his play about the Great Freddy. It's the only one I've never seen. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, you know, because uh, yeah. it's it's legendary. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mine's not a question. It's a comment of um, I actually facilitated Fourth Line strategic planning way back. Cynthia, when. yes, she did at Elmhurst. Elmhurst. I was there in a blizzard. <laughs> yes. And uh, but I still remember. Um, reading a proposal that Robert had done for the Moody Trail. And I was in a crowded subway filled with people in downtown Toronto. And I can still remember reading his proposal and being taken into the woods yeah. out of this crowded subway. Yeah, And that's it's so still, great. that's magic to me. For sure, yeah, I mean, oh, me too. Yeah, I mean, the Moody Trail cool. was a wonderful show. We read it recently and it held up nicely. We thought we did a reading with Community folks, were you in that one? Mm -hmm. You were not in that one. We should do a couple of those readings with mm -hmm. us. Love it. Those community readings, yeah, yeah. No, it's. Are you going to do it again for the fortieth? No. Yeah. <laughs> I heard you say that. Yeah. Oh yeah, actually, that's what we should do, right? No, nothing new. Actually, that's a really good point. We should do the Midi Trail for the fortieth. That one in the, the yeah. We said fall in love one. The fall in love. What's one? the one that? That's not that my record. Oh, that summer. That's we'll just summer. do. We won't be in the barnyard for the fortieth. Could you imagine? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Dave of French's. Yeah, that was. There was a scene in the that summer that was getting a little risque, like they were getting down to their underpants in the in the because it's a young love scene. I'll leave it like that. So they were starting to take their clothes off in the cemetery, and I did say to somebody like, if like Robert wasn't he was played the father of the two young teenage girls in it. And I did say to someone, you better, somebody better go get Robert and just have him look at what I'm doing here and make sure <laughs> this is okay. I mean, it was it was 1950s underwear, so yeah. everybody's bloomers were big. <laughs> yeah. you know? So, but they had, they got risque down to... Risque fourth line. Yeah, it was risque. Rob came out and he looked at it and he's like, yeah, let's talk. I was like, yeah. okay, okay, I just want to make sure. 
That's funny. Darcy, what's it like having one of your shows, seeing it in the big space? Well, it's kind of exciting. I've yeah. never done it before. I mean, I've always done the books and they come out. And yeah. So what, you know? So yeah, yeah. This is totally different. You know, it's a novel experience and at my age and stage of life, it's yeah. pretty exciting. It's thrilling, actually. So. Yeah, it is thrilling. <laughs> That's great. It's a great script. It is really such a great script and mm -hmm. such an interesting Peterborough story and... I remember like that iconic Tilco plastic sign. Mm -hmm. It's now a condo, right? It's Park and uh, Monaghan. Park, 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 Park and Park Hill. Park and Park Hill. Yeah, mm -hmm. Park and Park Hill. Yeah. So yeah, it's a uh, it's a condo now. Yeah. And I was talking to Mary Ellen McCann is one of our sponsors, and she said, "Oh, I, you know, that was the Tilco plastic. I sold a condo in there uh, last week uh, or something." You know, yeah. That's the thing about seeing the shows at Fourth Line too. Those we walk around the town seeing things differently. Mm -hmm. Like it does make you wait. What? That was here. That happened here. Yeah. It's pretty neat. Yeah. And we have so many exciting plays coming down the pipe. The Farmerettes and the story of Pearl Hart. She mm -hmm. was from Lindsay and, and then Coburg and then became one of the last uh, stagecoach bank ro and bank robbers in the United States dressed as a man. So oh. it, if in theory when it happens and it's big, it will have horses and women riding. And she worked with um, Calamity Jane and Wild Bill Hickok and all those. Mm -hmm. So she's from Lindsay originally. And then, of course... Wild Irish Geese, your your incredibly important um, mm. tome about the Robinson settlers, and then we're looking at something about the '60s scoop, and uh, maybe something about lacrosse, and mm. you know, there's just the ideas. Or we're never. I can't believe we've never run out of ideas, and it does not appear that we're going to. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. that, and people do say to me sometimes, you know, it's well, is it just Millbrook? Like, how could one place have so many interesting stories? And I. Quite often, say to people, I think if you sat down and you talked to the elders in your community, mm -hmm. wherever you are, there's not the exact same stories. And I, I quite often, I'm so curious about people when I chat with them. Mm -hmm. I feel like I always apologize in advance. I'm going to end up interviewing you. I'm just warning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but I always think, gosh, everyone's life could make a yeah. fascinating play. And it's usually the people who don't think they're as interesting that are the ones that are the most interesting and whose stories you want to hear the most. Those who broadcast them, you're like, yeah, I've heard that one. But those who haven't, it's like, tell me more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It was like Ona, Ona Gardner, the who you know ran the, was the operator for the telephone in Garden Hill for forty years, and mm -hmm. who knew that that play would become as big as it did, and that people would just adore it, and it would speak to people who had some of us had had the party line experience if we're mm -hmm. old enough <laughs> in the country, two long rings in Indian River, <laughs> uh, at, my aunt, at my aunt and uncle's, um, but that she would become a character that we saw ourselves reflected in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. Are there any other questions? Are there any more plays planned for out back theaters? For like the out in the back field? Yeah, out in the back field yeah. is where the um, natural amphitheater is. Yeah, well, I just made a commitment to do it for the 40th. <laughs> <laughs> so you've all heard it. <laughs> you know, what's, what was a challenge is, is a, the, you know, the company kind of got big. And it was, I think it's 150 seats out there. And the place where that summer and the um, Seton and attrition took place, seats about 200. So it just became a, a kind of a lousy math game where we couldn't kind of make it work financially. But I'm committed, it's actually a good uh, trillion grant. It's a good trillion grant to reanimate those spaces yeah, with some support, some, some governmental support. Because they are really important spaces. And we did uh, 1837, the uh, Rick Salutin's play, 1837, The Farmer's Revolt, back there. And it was incredible. It's a little hot to do a matinee. And you have to mm -hmm. do the matinee is the one a mile back in the bush. have to be matinee. We've done, like, Robert's play. I think the last one we did uh, uh, in the Grove area was Welcome Death. Rob's murder mystery, and uh, so you can do stuff there at night as long as you start at five thirty or six. But yeah, back in the woods, it has to be done during the day. So yeah, and all the time that we've been going to the theater, we've only seen one back there. Would you see the Farmer's Revolt or the Moody Trail? Ninety-seven was eighteen thirty-seven. The Farmer's Revolt. It was really a good play. I know. <laughs> yeah, I I love that. I, I stage managed it. And acted. Have you not? No. no. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, we took wagon rides of people mm -hmm. and, oh, and so walking great. tours of yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. I, oh my, everything has a story. Somebody took their 96-year-old mother on one of the wagons and her, she broke one of her vertebrae what? coming back. Like, oh. Oh. And so I just remember like having to run out to the top of the rise. I guess we must have been told in Milwaukee. And getting this older woman off of the thing. She, she wanted to get off of it. She didn't want it to wave and sitting her in a chair and just waiting for an ambulance to come and get her, you know, and they were sort of, they were embarrassed. Oh, I'm so sorry. I was like, okay, no, 
a vertebrae was, was cracked in <laughs> one of these, you know. It's just the stories upon stories of... When the, Welcome Death, one of the plays was <coughs> in the back, and there was a huge storm one night, and go ahead and tell that story, because it's classic. <coughs> Ironic storm. Well, I'll just say that we bought Welcome something Death. called a storm tracker after that. So it's a device that measures how far lightning is away. Because lightning is very serious, right? We all lived through the directory last year. We know how serious weather has become. But this was, was that 2009? Welcome Death? Eight or nine. And I was on top of a hill that whole, watching the play happen in, down in the bowl, and it was lightning all around, and dry lightning. Like, the, nothing was looming. It was <laughs> quite bright and sunny, but dry lightning. And uh, we just said, well, it seems like it's okay. It's okay. We're kind of counting in our head. And then as the got closer to the, the end of the play, which is going to be the reveal of the murderer, it started to move in. <laughs> And it, it got so ominous right at the end of that day. Do you remember that? That was the end of that, that August day. A few, unfortunately, a few people died in Ontario because it just, the sky looked fine everywhere because some people died playing outside, being at no family way. picnics on soccer fields. Yeah, it just seemed fine. But it got so bad so fast that I came rushing on stage. We didn't do a curtain call. I asked everyone to get back as quickly as they could to their, um, to their cars. But we actually had the van and I guess, I can't remember, who, but our company van was driving some of our more senior people. And I was left eventually on a bit of a hill with three older ladies, the last van ride out of, you know, Saigon, <laughs> <laughs> with metal canes. Oh, God. And I was like, ladies, put your canes on the floor and get into the porta potties. And I made them all go into those. So I thought, well, maybe, maybe plastic porta potties will be safe. <laughs> The play is called Welcome Death. Repackaging. <laughs> 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 yeah, you're uh, just like. No, so I, there are metal canes on the ground, so I thought those are not good. And so the van arrived, we got them in, they got me in, we got back. Not a drop of rain fell before we got them into the cars, but the sky went dark and green, and it opened up. And it was eventually, it was, but there were tornadoes around the province. We've had that happen. I mean, I remember once driving up the fourth line after the end of uh, Queen Marie, the closing night, and I called my husband to say goodbye to him. Oh no, no, God. sorry. That wasn't the night. That was, I, it was another time. <laughs> <laughs> my husband was behind me in another car, and I had my daughter in the car, and it just opened up. And then actually a, a tree fell on Rob's house, and the big sign, one of the signs from the plays, it got completely destroyed. But I got to the top of the hill and I called my husband and I said, we have to come back down. We can't safely drive in this. And so we just went into Robert's house till it was over. And then, yeah, another time I, I, I know the sky turns, I always want to tell the sky turns green or purple, I get really worried. I was driving by Quartha Downs and it was really bad and it was coming back from a show and I, I called my husband to say goodbye. <laughs> we didn't make it. And then one time on opening night at Baxter Creek, I was like, you know, went to the staff at Baxter Creek and just said, like, where, where do people go if there's a tornado? Like, is there a solid basement here? I mean, no problem. Just wondering. Do 53 yeah. people fit? Well, yeah, 250 <laughs> people. How yeah. are they going to fit down there? And yeah, yeah, no, weather is, weather is a thing. It's a thing. It's great, though. It's kind of what makes it fun, though. <laughs> <laughs> good attitude. Yeah, I it like is it. a good attitude. Yeah, I realize I'm not a person afraid of weather. Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid of rain. And, and I say that quite often about people who come and work for us. It's not everybody's thing. You have to really not be afraid of the rain and what could happen and the unknowness of it because we, we are trying for some, but some people are not baked for it. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, and we did the first preview of Veranda Society. <laughs> so we had two nights of preview shows, invited audiences. So I'm on stage and it was a long time of, of me being on stage. And I'm, I didn't know I was such a sweaty person <laughs> until I did a summer at fourth line. I was like, I am a disgusting human. Like I'm just wet all the time. <laughs> And I pour. And so we, we finished the first, we had this costume on, and I was trying in my mind to be like Catherine Hepburn, like high-waisted pants and a blouse. And I was like, this is going to be great. And I lay on the stage at one point, and I get up, and I've got like dirt stuff. It's just stuck. Like I'm soaked through the shirt. And it was a blue blouse. And I get like off a stage. Teal, like a deep teal. Teal, yeah. And I turn at one point, and I can, it has changed color. It's completely, like, black. And I'm so watching sweaty. it from the audience going, well, she can't wear that shirt. Yeah. <laughs> First thing, Kim, we come around the backstage, and Kim's like, great show. You are not wearing that outfit. <laughs> I was just drenched. But she, I know. Also, she also shorted out her own mic. Oh, yeah, to the point sweat. they had to start wrapping it in condoms. <laughs> yes. Before they strapped her body mic to her. That is a true story. 
That was the best. Like, and the poor sound guy. He was such a. He, oh, he's such a cute. He's adorably handsome, but also like really upstanding and gentle. And he was red faced every night when he had to put my sound pack in a condom and attach it to my bra <laughs> because my sweat would short out the microphone. The only thing that would work was a condom on my back. I'm like, this is mortifying. <laughs> so the later shirt was more synthetic-y. Yeah, synthetic. Not so quite. And spots and on it. Was it was burgundy with spots. So just <laughs> Oh, 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 cover it all a bit cover more. it up <laughs> yeah no you just you lose 10 pounds of sweat <laughs> I'm just you know I know being only 29 like myself Kim it's going to be a long time but <laughs> oh my gosh yeah talk about, yeah right yeah, but yeah. at some point Rob's going to yeah. Well, Rob's semi-retired Rob's now. Like Rob's doing his thing, which is basically being semi-retired and working on his own projects, and that's great for him. And we're we're, I'm we're just so curious thrilled. about like, are there folks in the offing to to carry for well, the mission? Cause... Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I have some ideas in my head, and we've just created a succession plan um, for the company because I worry about all those things. So you know, if I was to get really sick or drop dead tomorrow, you know, please let's not that happen. Then you know we have some plans in place, and then long term, I think like, I have a date. I have a date when I'm going to go. So yeah, so yeah, I'm I'm pretty clear on that. But I I'm not in any rush to go because I love it and would be happy to to stay. Kind of a version of forever, mm -hmm. which I'm excited about. Yeah. Oh, but, that sounds like the title of a great play. Yeah. <laughs> a version of forever. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. As we age into yeah. our... Form. Well, and it's hard when you're an integral part of the company and it so much of it revolves around your ideas and your vision and mm -hmm. and it becomes a hard thing and to hand off your baby is hard too. So Yeah. yeah. It's yeah, like handing no. it to a step parent and going, don't screw this one up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be, when, when the time is right, we'll put it in place. Like we're really, we are aware of it. Yeah. And, we're, yeah, and I'm, I would be excited for it to continue. Because I mean, that talking about going back to legacy and your, you know, what's your legacy? It continuing far beyond Robert, mm -hmm. far beyond me. That's mm -hmm. the, to me, the greatest achievement for, for a leader is mm -hmm. to be, to, to crave it, to continue past them. And we're in a, a very unusual position in the Canadian art scene, is uh, and everybody's grappling with it. Some of these companies are now forty and fifty and sixty years old. Who could have imagined that? Mm -hmm. And Cynthia, you've been around forever, with like me, not in a bad way. <laughs> we couldn't have imagined this in the in the eighties that companies would be celebrating. The Crows is celebrating its fortieth, and I had to sort of Crows Theatre in Toronto. I was like, really? Like Jim started that? And, mm. But yeah, and it's even catching more of a stride again. It's, it's it really great. is. So. The, these companies, there are lo there's a great deal of longevity in the Canadian mm -hmm. arts scene. So uh, some of the companies that were really tied to their artistic leader vision, some of those closed. Mm -hmm. They were very artist, uh, uh, founder uh, driven. Show. Uh, I'm thinking of the the opera company. I'll think of it in a second. Um, but it was dependent on the founder. Yeah, and mm -hmm. so when it was time for that person to leave, it closed. And it could have been the same thing at Fourth Line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and and. But we had a desire to keep it moving forward, mm -hmm. and it's a testament to I think to Rob and to mm -hmm. you and the leadership. Yeah, well, and the integrity yeah. of the organization. Sorry, I'm just butting yeah, in because yeah. so many art artistic or creative endeavors more broadly will dilute their mission chasing grant money, and who can blame them? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we got to pivot. The market's not what it was, da da. Mm -hmm. But I mean, Fourth Line's like clear and present. You know, mm -hmm. found like that integrity. Just the integrity of it. Just you've been clear about the mission since day one, mm -hmm. and wow, right? And it's worked, yeah. right? It's survived, and, and things are coming back. I was at Guild last night, and the whole run is sold out. I know, First isn't that amazing for something rotten? Yes. Sorry yeah, for the your ticket. Comedy, so, I yeah. mean, it, people are coming back to that. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. great. That's great. And I've worked in arts organizations that don't have strong mandates, yeah. and they are rudderless ships. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure you've worked with them to try to develop mission and mandate for them, and it's tough. And when you don't have that, that foundational center of the piece, it, it, um, you're kind of building something on quicksand. And we've, we've really built on solid, a bu solid building block with the mission and mandate. It's the lighthouse in the fog. It really <laughs> is, yeah. If you're like, what, what do we, oh yeah, what is it? And I, we go back to it all the time. Is this thing 
You know, we've done things outside the mandate. I'm thinking of giving that part-time religion. And we just, we said, this is outside the mandate because it's something that's a focal point for Robert. We want to celebrate Rob. It's a, a foundational piece of his early writing. So you do that, right? Mm -hmm. Or uh, Who Killed Snow White, James Thomas's play. We're doing it. It's outside the mandate, but it's part of this other thing. We want to look at mo what we define as modern history. It's not going to be everyone's cup of tea, but that's why we're doing that. You know, right. wanting to step outside of it. But oh. having it there is so important. Mm -hmm. Common yeah, question. Uh, I'm I know how many years Port Wine has been in existence, and the second part of it is, have you been there that time? The entire time, since, yeah, since the spring of 1992, with about four months before the first audiences ever came to the theater, I was a, um, a little assistant stage manager and actor and sewer of <laughs> costumes, which I'll just, uh, could I just brag? Yes, please. Quite yeah. often I will find those costumes that I sewed in 92 in our costume storage and I'm going to make sure at least three or four of them are on stage yeah. <laughs> because they're blazers. They were all cut for me by Martha Cockshut who was wow. the costume designer and they were these um, they were uh, bridal dresses. They were all, all those. So if you see the show this summer a lot of those old dresses were bridal dresses but they all have a, a muslin uh, yeah. what's the interior of what that called? Um, the lining, the muslin lining, and then the dress, and yeah, they're all brides. They're all bridal dress patterns from I think probably from Uptown Silk Shop. If anyone yeah. remembers yeah. Uptown oh, Silk, yeah, yeah, it's been a lot of years. Thirty-one back. years, yeah. yeah, that's good. Yeah, so I'll pull those dresses out, and my my own one that I wore as Colleen McCarty that I made as well. It she shows up. That one's done very well Yay. for us over the years. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much for being yeah. here, and we will see you in the new chairs this summer. Yeah, new chairs, <laughs> buy your tickets, they're on sale. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you at home. Thank you at home. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Peace out.